Welcome viewers. Today, as we gather once again in the studio of Scala News to discuss on the second week of the second session of the Synod on Synodality, we have with us Father Bimal Tirumanna once again, our Adamtrist, is one of the non-episcopal voting members of the Synod, appointed by the Pope himself. He is also a professor of moral theology at National Seminary in Sri Lanka and at the Pontifical Alfonsian Academy. He also continues to teach at Pontifical Urbaniana University and the Beda College in Rome. As we are aware that the second uh, session of the Synod is underway, halfway through, discussing on the theme for a synodal church communion, participation and mission. First of all, Father Vimal, could you give us a brief summary of the second week of the Synodal Assembly? A brief one. I'll try to be brief because it's a week. Uh, first of all, Sanjay, the week began on Monday morning with a lot of jubilation, happiness, because the Sunday before that, the Pope had appointed 21 new cardinals. Out of those cardinals, exactly a week ago, no? Yes. More than, nearly half of them are Synod members. Mm -hmm. So there are many, three from Asia and one Redemptorist, uh, Bishop Mykola the, of the Ukrainian Church in Melbourne, Australia, a Redemptorist. That's so true. now we have two Redemptorist cardinals, Cardinal Tobin and Cardinal Mykola. He's not yet Cardinal, but Cardinal-elect. Elect. So, the, the, the congregation, the assembly was very, very thrilled and happy that uh, there were new cardinals from among the members. <coughs> there are, Sanjay, altogether 263 members, uh, sorry, 363 uh, voting members. Out of that 70, as you mentioned, are non-episcopal members. I am one of them. Yes. Now, the beauty, you asked about the week. The beauty is now we are into the second week, rather. We just finished the second week. We are getting familiar with each other. You know, last year we already knew each other. And most of us know each other by name now. Not all. I won't claim that I know all the other 362 people. But uh, sort of a familiarity. And that enables you to work together well. When you know each other, no? like both of us know, and here we can do this interview quite well. Yes. The, 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 we are getting familiar with the persons, and we are getting familiar, Sanjay, I myself, am getting familiar with the special methodology of this synod. What do you mean by special methodology? Spiritual conversation. It's not just a discussion. As I said in one of the earlier interviews last year, each one intervenes and then after about two or three such interventions, there is a silence, a period of silence, at least one or two minutes, allowing to sift, allowing to discern what the Spirit is saying prayerfully. So that is a method. So we are getting familiar with that. We are getting familiar with our small groups, what are called circoli minori. We are getting familiar with interventions made in the plenary assembly. But most of all, we are getting familiar with, not with, I think it's the correct word will be, we are getting familiar to be prayerfully listening to each other. Sometimes, Sanjay, you may say a thing about this particular topic that I don't like. But I am now getting used to getting practiced at this synod to listen to you carefully. I may not agree, but oh, he's saying certain things. So that sort of thing. I, I, I think in this week we saw it mm -hmm. very clearly emerging. Uh, this week also, I, I want to say this. But some of the, the themes that you dealt with also. Yeah, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll come to that. Just, okay. just, just, just uh, let me say this. Good, okay. we should talk about them. No? That's true. Uh, not only in our small, uh, what are they called, small groups, Circoli Minori, but also in the plenary assembly, not only in them, we also exchange views, Sanjay, in our conversations along the corridors. 
while having a cup of coffee in the cafeteria, uh, in the special place that they have arranged. A lot of exchanges is uh, done. A lot of familiarity takes place. So these are some of the things that uh, uh, happened last week. Before I allow you that question, something positive happened in one line. Some concrete proposals are emerging. Well, that's true. Practical things. You were asking something. I just stopped you. You were asking about yeah, it? yeah, about the about the second week. No, what what all the things went on? How you see overall? Yeah, overall now I see that things are getting shaped more and more shaped and more and more concretized. Earlier we were talking theoretically, speculation, mostly speculation. I think at the last interview, if you recall, I said at the last Synodal Assembly, we were talking about what a synodality is. Now we are trying to talk about how a synodal way should be implemented. So it's like a plane, you know, we have been going up, up, up. Now we are slowly landing. Things are becoming concretized. Yeah, the more so you share, the more you discuss, the things come out very clearly. Precisely. Yeah, that's true. Precisely. And also, the, the Synodal Secretariat has been saying again and again that synodality is learned by doing. So the more we do these things, we are learning. Also, other things it will be interesting to know, uh, especially our viewers, uh, because uh, I believe there are 36 groups yes. in this synod yes. uh, to discuss yeah. on various matters. Yeah. So uh, it will be interesting to hear from you about your group, how you see your members in a group and how you discuss with them, how you share and all. Sure, very briefly. Yeah. First of all, 36 groups of participants. Each group has about 10 to 12, 11 to 12 members. Mm -hmm. Out of these 36 groups, 16 are English-speaking groups, vast majority. There are, I think, six Italian-speaking, five French-speaking, five Spanish. I'm not very sure about the figures, but English is the dominating majority, majority of groups. You are asking what happens there. Each group has cardinals, at least two, three cardinals, bishops, uh, religious or priests, lay people. And a lot of very good sharings are going on. I repeat, everything that everyone says is not in agreement with the whole group. But the whole group listens to each one. This is a beauty. You have to experience it. And I'm so happy that I have been given providentially this chance to experience it. To, we used to say, no, even much before synodality, to agree to disagree. Here it's not a question of agreeing to disagree, while agreeing to listen to you, we are also ultimately, thanks to the Holy Spirit and prayer, coming to a focal point, to a focus, to a central point. You said what happens there. Very honest exchanges. Now in my group, for example, you are asking about my group, no? Yes. There are two cardinals. One is Cardinal Supich from Chicago and the other one is Cardinal Michael Sherney uh, from Canada but he's working here in the Justice and Peace uh, that the dicastery and also a newly elected Cardinal, Cardinal from Japan mm. uh, and there are bishops. Bishop. Earlier one I had Cardinal Tobin, I think I said it last time and in these things what happened? We learn, we learn from one another, we pray together with one another we discern together with one another. Finally, finally, our aim is to listen to what the Holy Spirit is really saying. That's the small, small groups. You, did I answer your question? Uh, also, in the small groups, we are first having exchanges among ourselves about a certain topic. Thereafter, the methodology is very good. Thereafter, it goes to the uh, plenary afterwards that's but true. but first exchanges and that's very good rather than you being it it avoids being individualistic i want to show off i am the one we are a group that's true. and even at the end now this coming week and the week thereafter
we are supposed to present as a group our group proposals. I think that's church is after yeah. all communal, no? That seems uh, communal, uh, community very, oriented. Sorry. Yes, very clear. And and uh, the task oriented, you have to you know submit a report, and that comes out uh, very interesting for the. There is also, as we know, Father Bimal, that th this is the uh, time where uh, we continue to discern on this topic, communion, participation, and uh, mission. Uh, that is to promote a synodal way in the Catholic Church. Yes. Under this general theme, during this past week, you discussed the second module of the working document entitled Relations. Yes. Under this theme of Relations, did you uh, touch on ecumenism or the relationships of the Catholic Church with the other Christian churches? Could yeah. you explain, please? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Actually, this is the instrumentum laboris I was talking about, the working document, this one. And it is divided into four major modules. You used the word yeah. correct. Four major sections. And in the first week, we took the module of foundations. Theory, theologically, theological foundations, spiritual foundations. That's over last week, uh, the previous week. And this week, which we have just finished, as you said, we took up relations. Relations within the church, without the church, outside the church. Because synodality is relational, no? Yes. Synodality is walking together. Remember, we were saying it when we first had the interviews. So walking together, not Sanjay walking on his own, in his own direction not Vimal walking in his own direction. We are walking together in one direction, so relational. So in that sense, what you asked, you were very specific, ecumenism. That certainly came up, ecumenical issues. What is ecumenism? What did you, under, what did you want to ask, ecumenism, relationships with... Yeah, it, it is talking about uh, how, how uh, it is relevant uh, about the Catholic uh, Synod uh, is uh, for other Christians. Ah, precisely, precisely. Yes. That's what I wanted to get. Ecumenism, as we understand in Catholic parlance today, in Christian parlance, Christian language, uh, ling uh, Christian terminology, is the relationships among different groups that believe in Jesus Christ. We Catholics believe, but we are not the only ones who believe in Jesus. There are Anglicans, there are Methodists, there are Orthodox Christians who are not in communion with Rome. Now, in the 18th century, not 19th century, towards the 18th century, uh, excuse me, to, uh, in the middle of 19th century, I'm wrong. In the middle of 19th century, there was a movement, ecumenical movement, to bring all of them together. Why? Because as in the Gospel of John, Jesus prayed, Father, I pray that they may be one, as you and I are one. Because when the Christians are divided, Sanjay, it's a big scandal, no? Yes. Especially in our countries. You are from India, uh, I'm so from Sri Lanka. Them, yeah, People will ask, Competing ah, each other. Yeah, you know, and as if there are different Jesus Christs. That's true. Only one Jesus <laughs> Christ, no? So, and it was encouraged by Pope John the Twenty-Third, And later, Vatican II picked it up. So now, in this synodal journey, we have made a lot of progress before the synodal journey on ecumenism. There's a separate dicastery for Christian unity in the Vatican, actually. Now, in this synodal journey, in this synodal assembly, we have taken this as one of the themes also. So we did discuss. Uh, I want to just say one thing. I mentioned Pope St. John the Twenty-Third. His Feast day was on the 10th of October. I think a day after that was your birthday, no? Yeah. Uh, that's 11th celebrated. of October. But 10th of October, we had St. John the 23rd's birthday. And on that day, Thursday, it's Thursday, Thursday afternoon, evening, we had an ecumenical prayer meeting in the Vatican with just next to Paul the Sixth Aula, the hall. And so many ecumenical delegates came, different churches, and it was very impressive and very moving. What were we doing? Just sentimental? Nostalgia? Oh, we are together? No, no, not only that. It was to pray for peace. 
pray for peace in the world, pray for the marginalized, pray for various needs and to pray for Christian unity, visible unity. Because Sanjay, uh, I think Pope John Paul II, then Benedict XVI, Paul VI before that, and now Francis, they are all trying to get Christians together under a visible unity. It does not mean under the Pope alone, under the Bishop of Rome, certainly. But there are so many areas where we agree on. That's true. So in that sense, they are trying to bring up this Christian, visible Christian unity. So, I, I, I just want to say something because I jotted down something else. It's not only relations with other Christians, which is very relevant to Europe and North America. Some of us delegates felt that Synod should also talk about other religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Islam, Judaism. What about our relationships with them? I'm from Sri Lanka, you are from India. Asia, for example, is vastly, just only 3% are Christian. Asia is the biggest continent in the world. Asia has more than 60% of world population and only 3% are Christian. Christians. So, should we not talk about it? So, I was one of those who made a, an intervention even in the plenary last week on Tuesday, I think, about the importance of not only ecumenism, but also inter-religious dialogue with Buddhists, Hindus, Islam and others. Because if we talk about walking together, synodality, we are yes, walking sir. together with them, no? In our countries, yes, we are daily living inter-religious dialogue, no? Not theory. Very but much, yeah. Your neighbor is a Muslim and you are dealing with him. And it's not only in Asia today, in the world, in Europe, everywhere. So I just want to add that. Yeah, good. good to bring at that point very strongly. That's also very important. Yeah. yeah. With this week's discussions, uh, the Synod participants, participants looked at how all Catholics can serve church's mission. Also, I see one of the viewers uh, asked, what about the people, those who contribute to the Catholic Church? What are your thoughts on ways to serve the church by all the Catholics? first of all. Yeah, I think this is a very important point and I'm so grateful to that viewer of this who has raised the question because otherwise we are talking up in there, theory and big talk here. Does it touch the ordinary believer? Yes. There is something I want to say. I am now 37 years a priest. I have seen a big weakness among us in the Catholic Church. I don't know about the other Christian churches, Catholics. We think the church belongs to the clergy. By clergy I mean the Pope, the Cardinals, the Bishops, the Priests and maybe religious. Those who are in habit, Catholic. Church is there. We are just to go for Sunday Mass. We will just go for a novena, we will give some money, we will do some charitable work. But at baptism, whether you are cardinal, bishop, pope, priest, religious, or lay person, or lay, lay man, or lay woman, we were called at baptism for a mission. Each one of us is a missionary. Even my lay friends, lay people. Why? At baptism, we were given a mission to do two things. To bear witness to Jesus, our Lord, and to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And these things are to be done not only by the clergy. They are to be done by all the baptized, which is forgotten by many of us. But, Sanjay, sometimes there can be misunderstandings on both sides. Sometimes clergy think, who are the laity? Lay people, they don't know anything. They haven't done theology. They haven't done philosophy. Only we, the clergy, we have done. I have a doctorate, he has a licentiate here. Those doctorates and licentiates are nothing. Because Jesus has given a doctorate. Jesus has given a licentiate to everyone to be a mission, if you allow me to use that language. 
to be a missionary, to proclaim him, to bear witness to him. Here I said there are two, but that's one. But on the part of the people also, lay people, they often say, oh, we don't know anything, um, priests know better, the bishop is the best one. No, we are all walking together, this is synodality. We are people of God. Bishops, priests, I don't have the image, it's small, very small here. I don't think it can be called that synodal image where everybody is walking together. This particular one, bishop, priest, every So all of us have that mission. And uh, uh, I want to remind that every Eucharist, what is the last word, last phrase? The priest gives, priest or the bishop, the Lord be with you. Then may Almighty God bless you. After that, what does the priest say? Go, the Mass is ended. Go! You are sent forth. Go to the world to proclaim the mission you received at baptism. This is something we have forgotten. But let's also be careful. Let's also be careful. Let's say I'm a layman, married man. I cannot be a bishop. I cannot do what the bishop should be doing. And sometimes bishops or priests cannot be doing what the lay people are doing. We have different baptismal duties, different missionary duties. How? Who decides the difference? You are a layman, he is a, a laywoman, that is a bishop. Who decides? The Holy Spirit. You must be wondering whether I am going mad. Holy Spirit? Yes. At baptism, as St. Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans 1, 12 again, and in many Pauline letters and elsewhere we see how Holy Spirit gives charisms, gifts. You are an excellent speaker. He is an excellent teacher. He, she is an excellent helper. These are different charisms. You remember that yes, mystical yeah. body of Christ. Everybody cannot be... Everybody cannot say he has to be an ear or the head. Jesus is the head. Yes. So the Spirit has given different charisms. Number one, Sanjay. But all these charisms have to come together. Like, are you in a choir? Are you a good singer? Also, I can sing uh -huh. fairly well. Uh, don't sing here, but, <laughs> but whatever it is. In a choir, we have <laughs> different roles. No, That's I have right. seen uh, the, those who sing the soprano, the bass, the all sorts of things. Alto. Like that in the church, church is like a choir. Some people have to perform this role, that role, or this role. Depending on the charism, Holy Spirit has given. But there are two other types of charisms. Special charisms through ordination. In ordination, a person is ordained a priest sacred or uh, sacerdotal ordination. Episcopal ordination, a person is ordained a bishop. They have another charism. Then there's another charism of congregations, religious congregations like Redemptorists. We have the charism to proclaim that in Jesus there is fullness of redemption, especially to the most abandoned, no? So there are religious congregations, priests, bishops, lay people, all have different charisms. So like a beautiful orchestra, they have to come together. And this is where the word that is used again and again in this synodal assembly, co-responsibility comes. Now in this interview, your responsibility or your role is to ask questions, to animate. My role in this interview is to respond share my experiences. Gregor's role is to stay behind the camera, behind the scene and do things, those who are doing that. So all of us have to harmonize. Life is such, but church is much more because Holy Spirit is leading. This is Holy Spirit. He has given each one different charisms, different responsibilities, coming to the term which can be harnessed as co-responsibility, differentiated responsibilities. Also, even uh, in that line, I was thinking about an important part of synodality is implementing the proper understanding 
of a bishop's authority in his diocese, isn't it? Yeah. Which demands cooperation with lay people, certainly. Could you see, explain on this line? I think there are two points. Very, 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 very good. I'm happy probably this is the best question which hits the nail on the head with regard to synodality. Authority. A bishop, no, a bishop or a priest has authority. But in the Catholic Church, I think other Christian churches also, authority is for service. When a bishop is ordained, he is ordained a bishop with competence, with legitimate authority of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the risen Jesus, gave to the church. But that authority is for service, not for himself to just say, sit inside the car, the chauffeur comes and opens the door, he gives the ring to be kissed. There are some bishops who think that they are lords, no? I have seen sometimes, instead of giving the hand to be shaken, their hand is not coming like this, hand is coming like this. Oh, this, is, uh, <laughs> this, this is a very monarchical style. That's not the authority that the church believes in. I'm not talking my waves. This is what the catechism says. This is what the magisterial teachings say. A bishop or a parish priest or we, the religious priest, we have authority. But that authority is for service. This, this should never be forgotten. Uh, also, in a parish, a parish priest gives visibility to the Holy Spirit. I don't know, Sanjay, whether you have seen the Holy Spirit. I have not. But he is invisible. He is given visibility through the pastors. Let's say parish priest in a parish. The bishop in a diocese. They are only giving visibility. They are instruments in the hands of Holy Spirit for the yes. service of the community. So that's your first part of the question. Yes. And this is where I want to say something. Bishops cannot therefore, or parish priests cannot therefore, take unilateral, one-sided, dictatorial decisions. I'm sure in North India, from where you come, and also in my country, Sri Lanka, and in Asia and elsewhere, and Sri Lanka certainly, I have heard some bishops or some parish priests saying, let them do anything. Let, let Rome say anything. I am the bishop of the diocese. Here things will happen the way I want. Or parish priest saying, let our bishop say anything. I am the parish priest. Let I, as long as I am here, I am the boss. This is not, forget about synodality, this is not Christian. It's not Christian authority. So it's here that you asked about lay people. Bishops are supposed to work with the lay people, you said. Cooperation. Co uh, that's about Co Cooperate with the lay people. Not only bishops. What about priests? What about religious? We are to cooperate with the flock that is entrusted to us. Why? Because Holy Spirit doesn't have a direct telephone line to the bishop or to the parish priest or to the religious. Holy Spirit speaks through the whole community. Now, Sanjay, that's what we are going to, we were discussing in the last two days. We finished the module on relations and then we just entered the module on pathways. There, one thing that emerged, and we'll talk about it next week probably that's more, true, true. is about how the decisions are made. Let's say you asked about the bishops, a bishop or a parish priest, decide something. It has to be done in consultation in prayerful consultation and listening. I know one of my very good friends, he's a priest, senior, much senior to me, he used to tell me, Vimal, you know, they say I should listen. So what I do is I go and tell them, okay, tell me what it is, and I don't care about it. I hear from one ear and let it go through the other, I do what I want. Now that's not <laughs> listening. That's not synodal listening. Yes. And it's fooling the Holy Spirit, deceiving the Holy Spirit. So, active, prayerful listening is needed so that our decisions as pastors may not be isolated. They are really the decisions of the Holy Spirit. And Sanjay, last line there is, let's not forget, 
church is not the private property of any bishop or any priest or any religious. It is the property of the Holy Spirit. Bishops, priests and religious are only instruments in his hands. So they have to cooperate. Co-responsibility demands cooperation. Your point was lay people should be involved before making decisions in a parish or in a diocese. We should listen. Of course, the ultimate decision is of the parish priest or the bishop, but sincerely having listened to the people. That is why this you have the groups who go on discussing, sharing, so that afterwards the dis, uh, all the final outcome will be no, precisely, <laughs> precisely. That, 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 so this uh, is the process uh, you know, everyone should follow. Like, no, so everyone uh, uh, contributes uh, to the development, uh, to, ultimately to, to, to the church. To the church. Yeah. The service of the church. Yes. Precisely. Fully agreed. And, so. that's, exa and that's what synodality is trying. It's not a new idea. It's not even the Vatican Council. Before that, look at the Acts of the Apostles. The apostles, when they wanted to, I, I'll give one example. When they wanted to appoint deacons, because they felt their duty was to preach, not to uh, attend to the widows and the poor people. Remember Acts chapter 6. What did they do? They summoned the whole Christian community. That time it was a small community. And discerned together. No, before that, prayed together. Then discerned. Then cast lots. Stephen and the six others were chosen that way. So that's one example. There are so many others. Maybe we can continue on and on, but still, maybe the last one I please I would do. better better. It's quite like long. the synod on synodality continues to discuss the Catholic Church's future. Mm -hmm. How do you visualize the Catholic Church in the future when talking about new peripheries? Peripheries. Oh, that's a good word. That's a very good word. That defines not only synodality, it defines Pope Francis and his ministry, it defines uh, Jesus himself. Periphery. Periphery means the margin, the outer circle, people who are living beyond, far away. You are asking, will the synodal process lead to, uh, lead to a situation where a Catholic Church becomes a church of the peripheries? Exactly, that's what we are trying to, among other things. One reason is, why? We should ask why. Because Jesus was that. In the Gospel Sanjay, for all the four Gospels, Jesus goes to the people who are cast off, marginalized, thrown out. Lepers, leprosy patients, prostitutes, sinners, publicans. So, just like Jesus, Second Vatican II reminded us the need for church to be a church of the peripheries, of the margins. And this present Pope, Pope Francis, is really firm on that conviction. That is, we should go to the peripheries. And uh, by doing that, we are not imitating Pope Francis. We are not imitating synodal process. We are imitating Jesus of Nazareth. That's all. But I want to take Pope Francis as a good example of this dear Sanjay. He not only talks about peripheries, he makes his talk walk. Take for example, his appointment of cardinals now. Those days there were certain dioceses. Oh, that diocese should get a cardinal always. Here in Italy, I don't want to mentioned. For example, Milan would always get a cardinal. Right now they don't have. Florence and some other major cities in the world. But this cardinal is going, this pope is going to the peripheries where people are forgotten. Not only in the appointment of cardinals, in, the appoint, uh, in his choice of his tours, world tours, not tours, his uh, missionary visits. He goes to far away Papua New Guinea. He goes to a far away African country. Sometimes some of the major places are forgotten. I don't think he came to India yet. Not, not yet. Yeah. But, uh, but among his first ones was yes. Sri Lanka. 
because Sri Lanka had a lot of problems with violence and war. So he he's going to the peripheries where the victims are, where the uh, people who have been suffering, who have been forgotten. Uh, that's one. And lastly, he also is very firm on going to the peripheries with regard to the war victims, victims of violence, with regard to migrants, refugees. He is the champion of all of that. I think uh, to see some up uh, today is because I believe uh, you have uh, expressed and uh, shared with us a lot of things for this week and uh, I believe uh, the coming week too will be a fruitful one with Hopefully. your discussions and Hopefully. sharings and all that and I wish you all the best Thank and you. for our viewers continue to join with us connect with us so that we will bring you the updates of every week of this second session of the Synod. Thank you Sanjay. I Thank hope. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Since, since and we, we haven't celebrated your birthday, I hope we'll be able to celebrate it <laughs> after you. this being a Sunday. Thank you very much for Thank seeing. Thank you God very bless. much Bye. for listening.